for you. Get more out of your post office. The balance of a racing machine. The most powerful 1300 turbo in Britain. The three or five door Metro, one of the most agile cars in the world. And now the overall best selling small car in Britain. Austin Rover's 1985 Metro. One of the nation's new cars. Now we're motoring. anything like it. Tomorrow night on Grampian at 10.30, Bill McKenzie will be introducing our current affairs programme, Crossfire. And tonight at 11, Peter Bowles stars in another story about the Irish RM. But now here's Tony Bastable with Database. Disabled people are so severely handicapped that the only parts of their body they can control properly are their eyes. Tonight we report on the eye control computer. And we meet Ray Hazard, who has blown up in Northern Ireland and is now blind and yet can use a specially adapted computer as efficiently as a sighted person and much more efficiently than me. And I go racing at Silverstone. And don't forget to put your VisiCode decoder in position when the flashing white dot appears. Or better still, why not video record this edition of Database? amazing about this computer game is that I'm controlling it with my eyes. The electrodes fitted on either side of my eyes are picking up the eye's electricity. If I move my eyes to the left, the frog moves to the left. If I move my eyes to the right, the frog moves to the right. And there we are, I've won that game. Researchers have already developed other methods of controlling computers by eye movement. However, this system is not only more accurate, it's cheaper. About £300 to modify this BBC Micro, and it's British. Dr Griffiths, you led the design team at St George's Lincoln. Can you tell us primarily who was the system designed for? Well, we're concerned with those severely disabled people who cannot use the ordinary keyboard, of course. In fact, they're so disabled they cannot use any form of input, like a joystick or a mechanical switch. Now, we were using some game software there. What about other software that you were developing? Well, the first part of the work was primarily concerned with communication because many of the people we work with have no speech either. So we've designed some software that allows a person who is severely disabled with no speech to have some form of communication. Let me show you. In the system, there is uh, a floppy disk which has on it a series of letters on the screen which are in columns and rows. 
If I want to select a letter, I have to move my eyes in certain directions, as I'll show you. I'm going to spell out your name, Jane. If I look to the right, the system starts scanning across to the right. When it gets to the fifth column, I look to the left, and it starts scanning down. On J, I selected J, and it's now in the top left-hand corner of the screen. Now, A is in the second column. Again, I look to the right, then to the left, then to the right. And now I've got A. N is also in the second column. And we move down to N. And I've selected N, and we follow that with E. I suppose it's no accident that the letters you frequently use are on the left-hand side of the screen. Oh, no. That's designed within the software, of course, to make it as quick as possible. Mm. Now, that software you've specially written, um, how about controlling commercially available software? Well, this is a, a key issue that I think we should address, because it's no point writing special software for disabled people. We should allow them to use any software that is written for the system that they are working on. So if we change this disk, and using this system here called a keyboard emulator, we should be able to use my micro as a form of keyboard to drive that one, which has got commercial software. Shall we try? Okay, let's have a go. Well, while you're doing that, Dr. Griffiths, let me ask you, these systems are all very well, but they need to be got into the hands of the people who are going to use them. Are there anything like DH DHSS grants available to help in that matter? Well, I don't think the communication aids are actually available on prescription, but I do know of health authorities who have supported special cases for particular communication aids for severely disabled people. And does the system just run on the BBC Micro? Oh, no. The system is designed to run on... A uh, great many micros. We've had it running, for instance, on the Apple. We've also had it uh, running uh, on a Spectrum. Um, and so it's not restricted. As long as there is some switch user software available, then of course it'll run any system. Yeah. So let's have a go to see if we can now run commercial software, as we say. On the screen, there's another version of Beeblink. If I pick up the command for WordWise on your system, the command for WordWise is star w dot, which is on the top line. If I select that, here we go, star w dot appears, and it appears on your screen. Yes, it's on my screen as well. So you're now actually controlling my computer. Well, first of all, I've got to give it a return, and we'll see what happens. The, com the return command is on another page. It is over the over in the far right-hand corner. Oh, we've gone back again. Let's see if we can do that again. When I get to the top line, I'll give it a left. There we go. Now we're scanning across to pick up the word. Return, and as soon as that happens, I'll load up WordWise on your system. There it is. WordWise is now on your screen. Yes, and my screen's now showing word-wise. Well, Dr. Griffiths, we wish you every success with the system. Thank you very much for coming on to show it to us. It's been a pleasure. Such advances, of course, are of enormous importance if you are severely disabled, but if, if you can at least see. But supposing you can't, how do you then use a microcomputer to word process that letter or sort out a spreadsheet? Pretty difficult if you have no eyesight at all. Of course, there are devices made for those who are blind, things like this Versa Braille machine, which offers a limited form of word processing. You can send messages over BT Gold, but the disadvantage is that you have to know Braille to use it. And believe it or not, for all sorts of reasons, only about 10% of all the blind people in the UK actually read Braille. Take instead a look at this. It is, on the face of it, incredibly unimpressive. It's an ordinary piece of electronic mail which was composed and sent over BT Gold. The impressive thing is that the chap who composed and sent it is totally blind. It was 11 years ago that a young army officer on service in Northern Ireland was handed a parcel, an ordinary looking parcel, which to his cost, he discovered a few moments later when it blew up, turned out to be a bomb. Captain Ray Hazan. He now can see nothing. He's with us in the studio with his computer. Ray, what I want to know is, I have the benefit here of the VDU screen. I can see what you've typed in. 
but how on earth do you know where you are on the screen? How does it work? Well, this is the Frank audio data system, and what Mr. Joachim Frank, who's a German computer scientist, has done is he's taken a standard Osborne computer, he's put a speech chip under the keyboard, and he's added a, some extra keys. First of all, this special audio key here, and the unique system of these two slider controls. And basically, with those slider controls, I can get this voice to read out any part of the screen that I want. Um, the left vertical slider here makes musical tones as it goes past the line of information, like this. In fact, that first tone is the cursor, low pitch burp. Right. Those are musical tones. And then uh, that high pitch bleep means it's an empty line, so there's nothing there. So, if I locate the slider on a line and press the button on top, it will simply read that line out to me like this. Hello, and welcome to the listeners of database. So, now, I find that fairly tricky to pick up, but no doubt with some practice, you know what it's saying. That's right, and bear in mind, of course, it's only that I actually wrote this, so I'm half expecting what it's going to say. So you've got a bit of a head start there, anyway. That's yes, right. And then, once uh, we've got the uh, line on with the vertical slider, the horizontal slider on the bottom here repeats that line, but this time makes six different tones as it goes through the line, with different tones for upper and lower case, for punctuation marks, empty space, and so on. So, um, if I stop the slider on top of a word and press the button on the horizontal slider, it will do this. H-E-L-L-O-T-A. So it spells it out for you. That's right. So, with these two sliders, therefore, I can read line by line and spell out letter uh, by letter. And with the audio key and in combination with various other letters, I can get it to give me uh, punctuation marks to speed or slow the voice. Uh, there's something like 15 or 20 different uh, facilities I've got with this audio keyboard. I stand impressed, sir, but the real question is this. Can you be 100% accurate, and how do you clear up any errors you may have made when typing it out in the first place? Well, the first thing, of course, you've got to listen jolly carefully, and if they're phonetically obvious, you're going to pick them up right. that way. Um, then, um, now, if we take the third line, um, I've specially put the word adopted instead of adapted. Adopted for you. Now, say I want to change that adopted to adapted. There are two methods. First of all, of course, in WordStar, I can use the search and replace. Or I can, first of all, get the sliders on top of that letter that I want to uh, locate. O. There we are. I've got the slider on O of adopted. And now with the audio key in combination with the letter F, it will tell me exactly how much I've got to move the cursor to be on the letter O. Here we go. Cursor zero, two, down, zero, two, right. Two down, two right. Two down, two right, and now under this horizontal slide, I should hear a burp to denote, uh, denote that I'm on the O. Beat. O. There we are, and I would now obviously change that O to an A. So it's given you a grid reference of the screen, in fact. That's right, it works exactly on that principle. What sort of limitations does it have, Ray? Well, it can't read graphics, which obviously is important mm. to some people. Uh, I suppose you could say, of course, uh, as you've already mentioned, the voice is not always intelligible to some people, but uh, so I can assure you blind people do listen very carefully, sure, and yeah. bearing in mind that, as I've already said, they do uh, know what they've written, hopefully. Finally, and very briefly, how much does it cost, and can you get a grant towards it? Yes, the, in fact, <coughs> adaption is now done to the IBM keyboard, which mm. will cost you uh, £2,395. Um, it is commercially available, but in fact, the Manpower Services, Manpower Services Commission will give uh, grants of up to 100% for people needing it specifically uh, for their job, uh, and that scheme is administered by the Royal National Institute for the Blind. Ray, so I have to stop you there. Thank you very much indeed for bringing it in. Immensely impressive. Well, now, if you'd like any further information about either of those two aids we just looked at, then tune to Oracle page 159, where you will see something to your advantage. And now to something which, unfortunately, Ray here will never see. The world of computer graphics, this week with Dr. Mike Thorne. Absolutely still now, madam, please. Lovely. Well, uh, that should be ready, I would think, about the same time tomorrow. I'm feeling a little out of colour. Is it possible you could touch up the colour slightly? Madam, for you, it would be a pleasure. Thank you. Would Madam be requiring the uh, 10 by 8 or the larger size frame? Oh, the larger size. I'm sure Papa would prefer that. 
Well, madam, thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. Until next time, then. Oh, madam. The photography has come a long way since Victorian days. But cheap devices for getting images of computer screens on film and for getting pictorial images into a computer are still in their infancy. This is the Polaroid Palette system. At about £1,400, it's hardly cheap, but it's really intended for business computer users. It gives you instant slides or colour prints of whatever you can get on the screen of an IBM PC. Here, I've got a classic display of facts and figures, which at the touch of a few buttons, I can have photographed by this special purpose Polaroid camera. Let's just get it started. So we'll go back to the menu and select the exposure image. Tell it what sort of type of film we're using, which is um, color prints. It takes a little while now to load the appropriate program. Remove the safety slide from the camera and we can start the exposure. Color slides are obtained from a converted 35 millimeter camera which also comes with the system. It takes a couple of minutes or so for the exposure to be made. The image on the IBM PC screen is sent along this wire to the main body of the Palette system. We see on our screen what the camera sees, so indeed there's no need to adjust your set. If I remove the camera, then you can see a bit about what's going on. Just unscrew these two bolts. First, the red component of the image is exposed through a filter. There it is. And then finally, the green and blue components. Any image can be fed into the system, provided it's palette compatible. And more and more firms are producing such packages. Funnily enough, even though it's the Polaroid palette system, you don't get it from Polaroid. It's marketed in the UK by United Business Systems Limited, who also sell the Personal Presentation System, or PPS, as we doctors call it. PPS is a palette compatible graphics package for making photographs with which to advertise your product or company. It costs £550, and I've got some slides over here which have all been made using PPS in conjunction with the palette system. Now there's a sort of classic business display. Fairly detailed work there on that map of the UK. Another sort of map. Um, Oh, I don't know what that's doing there quite. That's a small place in the country, which I'm having done up. Uh, another sort of boring business kind of graph, really. Uh, oh, these really are horribly out of order. That's uh, an acquaintance of mine I met on a holiday in Paris. Perhaps we'd better stop there. Had I not ruined it by taking the camera off at a critical stage, our photograph would have been ready for developing about now. That takes a further minute, making a round total of about three minutes. And here's the sort of result you can expect. I did this one earlier on, and I can compare it with the original by pressing a button here. Getting pictures into a computer is still more difficult than getting them out. Until recently, the only choice was to sit down and do a computerized sort of embroidery. But with this new image processing system from RH Electronics of Cambridge, a whole new range of possibilities has been opened up. The system is plugged into a BBC micro, and then you plug an ordinary home video camera into the main system box. To control the system, there is software on a chip, and the whole thing costs just under 300 pounds. Let's select the image scan option from the menu, and then the image received by the system from the video camera will be converted to computer form. And to assist me in the demonstration, I've been able to acquire the services of a young lady I met earlier on. Now, if you just sit still once more, madam, you can process your image. And there we are. Thank you very much indeed. Having obtained an image, you can attack it with the accompanying software. In fact, I could remove her bonnet quite painlessly. Go back to the menu and select the image processing option, and then the pixel edit option. And there's the little cursor. Move it up, and now we can start to paint over what we've already got on the screen bit by bit, very painstakingly there. As you can see, it's quite a time-consuming process. It's slightly less difficult if you use the RH Electronics light pen, which also interfaces with the system. Using it, I've been able to satisfy all those who wanted to know if there really is a chin under all this hair. Look, 
Here's me with beer. Let's go back to the main menu first of all, and now load an image I saved earlier from disk. There we are, and now, uh, me without. I must say I'm really glad I don't actually look like that. Still, if you're thinking of shaving it off, wouldn't it be nice to be able to experiment first with this system? And thanks to a printer dump routine supplied with the system, I can also have a printout of the image. Now, I do have a few spare hard copies, so if someone would like one and can afford the asking price of £120, signed, of course, do drop me a line. No? Well, anyway, changing your image is an exciting possibility, even at an early age. Cashing in on children's fantasy worlds is a good way to teach them to read. And this programme, Kermit's Electronic Story Maker from Simon and Schuster of New York, tries to do just that. Designed for children aged four and up, you don't have to be able to type. Just enter words using a joystick and you could be transported into outer space before you can say, Planetarium? Well, what do you know? Isn't it wonderful? Fantasy world's just not the word for it. Children are given a dictionary of the words the system understands, and a sentence appears for them to fill in. Whatever they enter actually happens, so before long you could find yourself in a soup. And it must be chicken soup, because here's a swimming chicken. All this because I entered in the soup the chicken swims using the joystick. Better still, you can link the actions in each sentence together. Wetter and wetter still, we're now under the sea with a dancing bathtub. I don't suppose it'll ever beat the popularity of shows like Fame, but in the USA, this computer program got into the educational software top 10. And now for something completely different. Our monster friend here is bouncing on a hippopotamus. That looks too dangerous to me, so I think we'll leave him to it. Back to the safety of the city, and a banana rolling in the car, and a ringing telephone. If anybody wants me, the number's already engaged, unless you're ringing to say you prefer me with a beard. Bye. Mike Thorne without a beard, that'll be the day. The standard of some home computer software graphics is now really good, so I thought I'd test drive some. What better place than Silverstone? David, that was amazing. Thank you very much. Now that's inspired me to go on to drive bigger and better things, for example, a Formula 3 car. But the closest I'll ever get to driving one of those is probably in a simulation package. And there is one. It's by Aconsoft, and it's appropriately called Rev. David, I suppose driving a Formula 3 car is very different to the two-seater that we were in. Yes, it is different. The Formula 3 car is somewhat faster. And, of course, you haven't got to change the... Uh, when you're in the car in the middle, you haven't got to allow for the fact that you're sitting on one side of the car. Right, and this is the Formula 3 car that the programme is based on? That's right, yes, this is the one. OK, let's go and take a look at the programme. OK. OK, we're going to have a go at a race. The car's in the pits. I've been asked to select my wing settings, which are to uh, give me the balance of the car that I want for the race. And now we've got the car on the grid and I'll start up the engine. We're now rowing to go. Right, the lights are on, we're waiting for the start. There you go. And we're off. We're away. Not a great start. It's all going all right at the moment. A bit of a squeeze coming on here. If you keep your eye on the position thing, you can see exactly where I am. You've moved you... up so far to halfway. Yeah, we're up to tenths from the back. Come up to the first corner. On with the brakes. 
I hope I don't get hit by anyone else. Whoop. Oh, we've had a shunt. Yep, we're off. Finished. We'll get put back on the track now. Start the engine. Now we've got to give chase as best we can. How does this compare to the real thing? Um, well, it's very accurate, actually. We spent a lot of time making sure it was. And uh, the track itself is, is a scaled, accurate translation. And the cars have the right amount of power to weight ratio, um, as well as the right, right amount of downforce and tire grip. So the whole thing turns out that if you're driving the car well, you will go around in exactly the same time, with exactly the same sort of feelings as you would in, the, uh, in a real car. The only real difference between the two uh, situations is that, of course, in this game, you can afford to learn and make mistakes and end up in the barrier. It doesn't hurt very much. Well, I'm glad we didn't crash outside. Thank you no. very much. The Red Software was written by Jeff Grammond, who is no stranger to simulations. He wrote the highly successful Aviator game. I asked Jeff how much research he had to do before he started writing the code. Well, initially, um, I had a meeting with David Hunt, and we discussed uh, Formula 3 racing in general, we decided what uh, the contents of the program would best be. So we um, started off using um, an ordnance survey map, um, although the accuracy of that we, we weren't too sure about. And in the end, we used um, an aerial photograph, which turned out to be uh, to give the best reliable information. Uh, besides that, um, I also went around the circuit with David, stopping here and there, taking photographs. Um, to assist with the gradients and things like that. I like to think it's pretty representative, and uh, it's certainly uh, given me an interest in having a go with the real thing, in fact. Can we expect to see revs implemented for any other machine than the VBC? Well, we're, we're looking into this at the moment. Jeff, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> oh, a smashing game, that, revs. Unfortunately, still available only for the BBC Micro. And as for poor old David Hunt, well, even more bad luck for him, because, of course, since Olivetti took over Acorn, he's out of a job again, because they already sponsor the Brabham Formula One team. And if you take that story a stage further, don't forget that one of Olivetti's principal shareholders is the giant American corporation, AT&T. So you could argue that the dear old BBC Micro is now 50% British, 30% Italian, and 20% American. Work that one out. Well, that's all for this week, except to remind you about our mailbox on Prestel, page 7776, and database information on Oracle, page 159. See you next week. Bye. In a sensational trial offer from Hydroelectric, you can get 12 months interest-free credit.